Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here is your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Hey man, we're going to talk with Raul Pal today from Real Vision. I promise you'll love this. He's unlike anybody else we've ever interviewed. He, he just, he sees the whole world and just delivers you one pristine, perfect trade on a silver platter. And, and I, I'm pretty sure he's going to do that for us today. But first, first, let's talk about the thing people can't stop talking about. The, the, we can't not talk about this. And, and of course, I'm talking about the coronavirus. Okay. So you can track the progress of the disease in China and elsewhere by looking at the Johns Hopkins coronavirus tracker. If you just Google that, it'll take you to it. And it's got a little dashboard and it tells you how many cases. We're at more than 20,000 cases of this thing now. And it shows you a map of where they all are. And it tells you how many people have died and where the cases are and where the people have died and, and how many people have recovered from this thing too. So, there's 20,000 cases of this thing right now. And that's up from, you know, January 19th when there were like 282 cases. Um, and, and the overwhelming 99% of these are still in China, although there are more in several other countries. And, uh, you know, it, it, it keeps on keeping on. Now, of course, uh, you know, there are cases on every continent except Antarctica. Um, and of course, if you know me at all, you probably know what I'm about to tell you. Nobody knows how this will ultimately play out. I think it's a little worse than that, though, because along with the uncertainty, I don't trust the numbers coming out of China. You just think about that culture and that government for a minute. And, you know, they have a tight grip on society there. You know, they have a surveillance society. And everybody, you know, the, there's a strong incentive to conform and not rock the boat. You're not allowed to criticize the government. You got to do what they say. And so there's this huge cultural thing where the, the worst thing in the world for a billion four Chinese would be for anyone to feel like the government doesn't have things under control. So the government gets things under control and it makes it hard because they want to control the narrative so much, it makes it hard for the outside world to ever know what's going on on inside. And, and remember, like the Chinese government only started reporting the extent of this thing once folks in Hong Kong started getting it. And, and then, you know, the, the information flow out of Hong Kong is much better. So they had to kind of fess up. According to a January 22 article, in the New York Times, the country has tightened its grip on internet media and civil society since the outbreak of SARS virus back in 2003. The article paints this picture of a country that should have become more open after that, but instead has become more clamped down and closed off. A former Chinese journalist quoted in the article said, only the government is allowed to speak publicly about the virus. Everybody else, they just want everybody else to just shut up. <laughs> One thing I've noticed from the Hopkins statistics, the Johns Hopkins statistics, is the overwhelming majority of the deaths were in the, the Hubei region where Wuhan is, where the virus started. And everywhere else, the death rates are kind of low. So, you know, if you wanted to assume the worst, you'd, you'd have to assume that maybe deaths are being underreported elsewhere in China, possibly. The virus has been compared to... Uh, the SARS and MERS viruses, after nine months, there were like 8,000, just shy of 8,100 SARS cases worldwide, and then it was over. MERS has been going and is still going since 2012, and there's only 2,500 cases reported. And, you know, Corona passed those numbers in days, right? And, and it's over 20,000 now. SARS killed 10% of those infected. MERS has killed one-third so far, according to the reported figures, looks like roughly 2% of reported cases have resulted in deaths. 
But again, overwhelmingly, those numbers come out of China, so I'm not really sure. H1N1 flu in 2009 killed 285,000, which was a really low death rate. A lot of people got that. The death rate is like 0.02%, nothing. The Spanish flu of 1918 killed tens of millions of people. I've seen estimates as high as 50 million. Maybe 10%, maybe as much as 20% of everybody who got it died. But so many people got it, and medical care was so poor at the time that lots of people died. Overall, I'm going to assume that in public, they'll do whatever they deem necessary not to lose face and to make the world understand that they have this under control. They, they might underreport the new cases. They might underreport the deaths. Inside the country, they'll prosecute anybody who says anything about the virus that they don't like or, or even hints at criticizing the government's handling of it. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, I do assume, though, that they'll do anything to stop the spread of it. That's one good thing that China will do. Uh, they'll shut down the whole country. They'll stop at nothing trying to, to get the result they want to create. Um, so there will be a significant impact on global commerce uh, while this is playing out. And just like, for example, China air travel is 12% of global air traffic. That's huge, right? Um, also, for example, crude oil is already down substantially, uh, down 13 or 14%. That's a $1.7 trillion global market. If the price falls you know, 30%, that's almost 600 billion, you know, just sucked up out of that if that happens. You know, if Corona keeps scaring people and, and spreading and governments and businesses keep shutting things down to combat the virus, well, I think oil will keep dropping and we will get that 20 or 30% drop. While the US stock market doesn't seem to be that scared, copper is down 10%, gold is off a few percent, Companies like Apple and Starbucks have closed stores in China. Apple says it's temporarily closed all 42 of its stores in China and will reopen on February 10th. It'll be interesting to see if that comes true. If it doesn't, you know, maybe the market takes it as a bad sign. Remains to be seen. Starbucks also said it's closing more than 2,000 of its 4,300 China stores. Also, you know, temporarily. I'm doing air quotes. You can't see me, but I'm doing air quotes. Temporarily. We'll see how long temporarily is. They're not alone either. McDonald's, KFC, Dairy Queen, Pizza Hut, all closing stores in China. Ikea has closed all 30 of its China stores. The Gap, Old Navy, H&M, all closing stores in China. Macau, the so-called semi-autonomous Chinese territory that is also the biggest gambling destination on earth, um, has, has asked that all of the casinos close up. Last night, as we record this podcast early, earlier in the week, I, I spoke with Michael Covell, a trader we interviewed on the podcast not long ago. He's based in Vietnam. He asked his father, who is a doctor on the East Coast, to send him some masks to wear over there in Vietnam. His father said, yeah, sure, I'll send them to you. And then his father got back to him and said, uh, uh, they're back ordered. It'll take four months to get them. And he said, go on Amazon. And I did. I went on Amazon. And this is not like getting masks in Asia. This is buying them in the U.S., right? And I went on Amazon. I eventually found one source that said it could deliver them to me in a couple of days. But several of them said it would be like a few days. So, I, you know, I know a couple other people, like some people who are on the ground in Asia or, or even in China recently. And they report weird things like, you know, people being confined to their apartments by force. And it is, this one guy on the internet posted this thing, and you never know if these things are true or not, but it seems plausible, given what's happening, given the Chinese government, that there was this huge piece of metal welded to his front door, preventing him from leaving his apartment. And, you know, I would suspect that there's a lot of that sort of thing going on. My overall sense is we're in the early innings of learning about the true state of the virus. I saw at least one report that said computer models suggest the number of cases ought to be closer to 100,000 right now. And that was when the Johns Hopkins map said less than 18,000. That's the way these things go. Lots of uncertainty. Nobody knows exactly what's happened. Nobody can predict what will happen. Markets hate uncertainty, of course. If it gets bad enough and there's like outright panic in society in China, which I kind of don't think will happen, various financial markets might, might show panic as well. 
China is already trying to get ahead of all this with government stimulus in the stock market. The first day the market was opened earlier this week, it fell 9%. So, you know, their efforts are not quite bearing fruit there. But believe me, the Chinese government will absolutely have no qualms and zero hesitation in, you know, borrowing whatever they need to borrow, doing whatever they need to do to prop up the securities prices and its own economy as much as humanly possible. You know, the Chinese economy is up eightfold since basically the beginning of the century. And I'm, I'm sure some of that growth was the result of the stimulus designed to combat the depressing effect of SARS, you know, back in 2003. The Federal Reserve will probably take massive action too, I think. You may have heard that markets are discounting a June rate cut. I think it'll be more like March. Um, and, I, and I don't know how much, you know, they've been doing 25 basis points, you know, maybe more than that. I don't know. I don't really have a feel for, for, for that. But, but definitely sooner rather than later, I think. Um, we interviewed Harris Kupperman in a recent episode, um, you may remember. He said he doesn't know exactly what the timing will be, but that you can and should buy the entire periodic table of elements, meaning commodities, because, you know, China is a big commodity user and they will stimulate their economy massively um, and it should support those prices. Of course, they're falling now. So, you know, timing is anybody's guess, right? So there's a real bottom line for investors, right? You know, everybody wants to know what, what the hell do I do? Anything, nothing, sell? run, make my own, you know, surgical masks. And and I have to acknowledge, you know, the S&P 500, um, I mean, it's maybe as I speak to you, 2% or so off its January 17th high. But, you know, the market is kind of up as I'm speaking to you. It's like, hey, all clear, nothing to worry about. You know, just everybody, you know, go to your homes and places of business, nothing to see here, move along. I don't think that's true. I don't think it's really over yet. So, you know, I mean, all that needs to happen to take another, what, I don't know, 5%, 10% or something off the, the S&P 500 is for the market to start believing, wow, this thing is much worse than we ever thought. But of course, you know, it's funny I'm talking about this because I was going through my phone yesterday, deleting old messages and notes I had taken at conferences that I didn't need anymore. And... I came across this one note, and it just had this quote on it by the, the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, who lived, I think, it's not known, maybe between the 4th and 6th centuries BC. He said, those who have knowledge don't predict. Those who predict don't have knowledge. And man, is that right up my alley. I'd like to think I know something, a little something, after decades at, at this you know, negotiating with financial markets on a daily basis, you know, so I, I don't like to predict. And I think that's, I don't know, I think that's something you learn. If you learn anything from financial markets, trying to predict is, is sort of not a great idea. You can try to trade this thing. And, and I don't think it's probably too late to, depending on how it all plays out in the next, I don't know, few weeks, couple months, whatever. You know, being short stocks was cool. You could have perfectly timed you know, maybe a out of the money put option purchase on a big equity index, but you really have to get it right because stocks are so volatile. Being long bonds is kind of easier, less downside. But to take advantage of this type of thing, like you can't do a deep dive. You have to dive in early in anticipation of panic setting in later. You can't hesitate and and. You can't ever do enough homework. You just have to understand it's that type of situation. You know, I want to be short stocks, long bonds, whatever it is you want to do and do it. You can't hesitate. It's, it's a speculation. You know, you're just counting on it playing out like previous episodes, you know, SARS, whatever. And so, you know, I don't really write about or recommend that sort of thing. So, you know, you're not going to hear anything you know, definitely recommended for me. Anybody who's taken my advice over the last few years is well positioned coming into the coronavirus episode because I've been recommending the same kind of three-part, simple but diversified portfolio of plenty of cash, gold, and sure, stocks wherever you find something cheap enough. 
Um, and, and, you know, a good enough business that's selling at a, at a reasonable enough price. You know, so not Tesla at $900, <laughs> you know, when it's bigger than the market cap of like five other car companies and, you know, it's making a few hundred thousand cars and they're making 20 million, <laughs> you know, not that. So, you know, cash, gold, stocks where you find value. And I think that's going to treat you well during this. You know, it like just holding cash is not going to make a ton of money. But in extreme value, we do have a way to just put a little bit more juice in your cash holding while not taking really any more risk. And we're actually this month in extreme value, we're going to we're going to add another little ingredient to this that will further diversify it and contain I think at this point, a really asymmetric payoff ratio. So we're going to show you how to limit your downside to just next to nothing and expose yourself to, I don't know, 10, 20, 50, 100 bagger type type upside potential while diversifying at the same time. Kind of nice. But that's really all I have to say about that. It's an ongoing situation. I think it definitely gets worse. I think it's definitely going to be a lot more than 20,000 cases of, of the disease around the world. You know, I think it'll impact financial markets. Like I said, you know, I think the cash gold stocks portfolio will do just fine and, and protect your assets. And you'll probably get a, an opportunity to buy something cheaper in the, in the equity market here in the next few months. You know, say just between now and June even, between February and June. And um, I think that's the way it goes, man. Uh, so uh, let's... Let's go ahead and talk to Raul Powell because I'm going to ask him about this, and I, I, you know, I can practically guarantee he'll have have great ideas about it and great information to share. So let's do that. Before we do anything else this week, I need to tell you something really important right now. My Stansberry colleague Steve Sugarud says the 11 year bull market we're in is about to take a huge dramatic shift starting February the 12th. Steve told me recently that he can't wait for February the 12th. He says folks have no idea what's coming, but he expects it to turn thousands and thousands of well-prepared investors into millionaires. He says he's seen it happen before and it's about to happen again. I haven't had a chance to find out exactly what Steve is talking about, but I always take him seriously because he's made a lot of investors a ton of money. I can't wait to tune in on February the 12th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time to hear what Steve has to say. Go sign up right now at www.investorhourmeltup.com by entering your email address. They'll send you a link so you can log on and hear what Steve has to say on February the 12th. That's www.investorhourmeltup.com. Do it. Okay, today's guest is Raul Powell. And Raul Pau is a former hedge fund manager who retired at 36. He's co-founder of Real Vision, a financial media company offering in-depth video interviews and research publications from the world's best investors. He has run a successful global macro hedge fund, co-managed Goldman Sachs hedge fund sales business in equities and equity derivatives in Europe, and helped design the BBC TV program Million Dollar Traders, training participants in investment and risk management strategy. Raul retired from managing client money and now lives in the Cayman Islands, from where he manages Real Vision and writes for the Global Macro Investor, a highly regarded original research service for hedge funds, family offices, sovereign wealth funds, and other elite investors. Raul Pal, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much, Dan. Great to be here. So, you know, Ralph, I, I want our listeners to know you better. Uh, I bet some of them may not have even heard of you, even if they are like Real Vision subscribers. I don't know. I'd like to know when did you, like, when was your first inkling that finance was the career for you? How old were you when you first figured that out? I'm 52 now. So I was a, I was at university and just before university during the crazy 80s. So, you know, when everybody was driving around in red Porsches and wearing braces um, and um, Wall Street, the film was out, it was piquing my interest. And I never forget, I was, I just finished my degree. I did a degree in economics and law. And my father's background was marketing. 
And he was saying, you know, you should go into, you know, fast moving consumer goods marketing. It's always a great business. And I remember sitting down with a friend of his saying, listen, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do. I didn't have particularly great grades. So I was trying to decide, well, A, who would give me a job? It was the recession in 1990. So there was a huge banking recession and a number of other things. So I was trying to look for a job then. I spoke to this guy and said, so what do you think I should do? And he said, well, it's very simple. He said, you can go and work for Mars and they'll give you free Mars bars. Or you can go and work for a bank and they'll give you free money. It was that point I realised that that was the choice I wanted to make. <laughs> <laughs> That's not much of a choice, is it? That's pretty easy. So, and then wh- what was your first gig? My first gig was um, I started, I couldn't get, because it was a recession, I couldn't get into a bank. Um, and so, and I didn't have, I didn't go to a particularly great university. I was too busy enjoying the social life. So my first job was for Dow Jones Tellerate. So um, people who've been around for a while will remember them as the kind of precursor to Bloomberg. So they had, you know, every single dealing room. If you've seen the film Wall Street, all those green screens, they're all Tellerate screens. So I worked for them, training people in technical analysis. So they had a product called Teletrack. So I trained people in technical analysis, learned technical analysis on the hoof myself and realizing I was very visually driven and that I could understand the narrative of markets by that. I then managed to eventually after doing uh, moving into business, uh, new business sales, I managed to somehow get myself a job on a, in a very prestigious firm called James Capel, who were like the queen stockbrokers. But they were also one of the biggest institutional brokers in the UK, part of HSBC. And I got a job on their equity derivative desk uh, selling international stock index derivatives. And luckily for me, within six months, my boss left. I got promoted head of the desk and that was my career started. Wow, nice. When, you know, what, what? Tell me about the transition from, you know, a, a guy with a pretty good job to, uh, you know, real vision, uh, internet finance, TV entrepreneur. What was what, what? What? What happened in between there? So yeah, what happened in between was I started speaking in the early '90s to some hedge funds. I'd have also been following Jim Rogers on the. Uh, Barron's Round Table and his book, uh, A Venture Capitalist, where he went around the world on a motorbike. Um, and sorry, Investment Biker, he went around the, uh, the world on a motorbike and kind of looked at the world in a top down way. And I realized that's how I saw things. And as I said, I'm a r- relatively visual thinker. So putting together the technical analysis, understanding the big picture narratives, and taking that very top down view, which is now commonly referred to as macro, I realized that was what I liked. And I was early to this game where the big hedge funds at the time, people like Tiger, Tudor, Soros, were really starting to make their impact known in financial markets. And I was dealing with them as my customers. So I started to speak to these people, people like Paul Tudor Jones on a daily basis, Stan Druckenmiller, um, Lewis Bacon at More Capital, the most famous investors in the world. And I was their go-to guy in Europe. And it was an extraordinary time for me. Eventually, We moved um, from James Capel to um, uh, NatWest, uh, the big UK bank at the time. And then finally got poached by uh, the the partner who ran equity derivatives at Goldman Sachs to come and start the hedge fund business at Goldman. So that was a gift of an opportunity. It was about 1997. Goldman Sachs had been slow to the hedge fund business in equities. And so I was given the dream mandate of building a business from the best reputational firm on earth. And so it was the easiest business to build, but we built it into a hell of a big business. And then at the peak of the dot-com bubble, I knew it was going to bust. I'd been writing about it, talking about it to my clients, and eventually one of my clients called GLG Partners, who were the largest hedge fund firm in Europe at the time, um, said, look, why don't you come and and, um, run a macro portfolio for us? So I opted across to the dark side and moved to the hedge fund business. So I started running a macro portfolio. That went extremely well. Uh, so then I found it. So they gave me the cap- seed capital um, and al- allowed me to, within GLG, found and uh, manage the global macro, the GLG Global Macro Hedge Fund, which I did for several years over the crisis, uh, over the uh, dot-com bust and over those kind of very exciting times. And then eventually in 2005, I decided to opt out of the rat race, uh, move to the Mediterranean coast of Spain, and I started writing Using my kind of unique experience, I was 
one of the more experienced people in the hedge fund business. I'd run a hedge fund. I, I knew all the hedge fund managers. I'd serviced them all. I'd seen the growth of the industry. I knew how they looked at things, and I looked at things in the same way. So I started a um, kind of a very high-end uh, investment research business called the Global Macro Investor that I still run to this day. Um, and that was advising the world's largest hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, family offices, asset managers, governments um, on macro investment strategy. Um, and so I was doing that in Spain for a long time. The financial crisis came along in 2008. And I realized that I was at the epicenter of it all. You know, many of the people in the big short were clients of mine. I knew what was going on. I was very much at the heart of the system. But friends of my parents and friends of friends would come up to me and say, well, why didn't we know? And that sat really uncomfortably with me, is why do some of us know and others don't? And I thought, this is not right. Um, and that was the same with the rise of the Occupy Wall Street movement and all of this other pushback that we're still seeing today is why do some people get everything and others get nothing? And I thought, I want to do something about it. It took a while to realize until I uh, met a gentleman called Grant Williams, who uh, many of your listeners will know as well, who's one of the co-founders of Real Vision. He had a, a newsletter business, which is a $300 newsletter. So very different to mine because mine's $40,000 a year. Um, very different ends of the market. But he started making video. And I realized that video was the future, both only for the newsletter industry, but also for the future. Video on demand technology was very disruptive to the TV companies like Bloomberg and um, particularly CNBC, who had really kind of lost the trust of the viewers because of their coverage of the financial crisis. They were too late, too much cheerleading, and not enough fiduciary duty. So that day we had a dinner in Spain one night and over a few glasses of wine, we decided that we wanted to start a business. Woke up in the morning and still thought it was a good idea, which is usually quite rare after a few glasses of wine. And so we started Real Vision. We had no idea what we were doing, but we were on a mission to democratize the very best financial intelligence and bring it to everybody. So we thought, well, how do we do that? A, we've never made a video before. Well, Grant had made a few, but they were pretty crappy. And I'd never made a video before. We had no idea what we're doing. There's four of us involved. Um, and um, so we, I just reached out to my kind of Rolodex of the world's most famous hedge fund managers and said, listen, would you come, would you be prepared to be interviewed for like an hour? Because everyone said, well, if you're going to do this, you need to have short form because there's no attention span and it needs to be free. So we decided, forget that. We're going to do subscription and long form because finance is a real meaningful topic that has a clear value proposition and we know it from the newsletter industry and um so these hedge fund managers said yes we'd love to nobody's ever given us an hour before we get 10 minutes three minutes on cnbc it's a waste of our time and it's just cheerleading as opposed to real deep dive nuanced understanding of what's going on so we started with that and before you knew it people started engaging by word of mouth dramatically and it grew from there and it's become an incredible thing. We've had documentary series on PBS. We've, we've, um, you know, we've probably got um, the world's largest um, um, interview series for finance, which is the Real Vision interview, and a whole bunch of really exciting things. Have people find our content on airlines. We have a free channel on YouTube, the Real Vision channel, and we also have our main subscription business. Plus, on top of that, we built some tiered membership businesses a live events business. And we also work with the world's largest financial corporations, RAA firms, asset managers, investment banks on creating and distributing content for them. So it's a really exciting thing. Yeah, it is super exciting. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan myself. It's like every American's dream to sort of sit and watch TV and be able to say, I'm doing work, I'm doing work. And I can do that with Real Vision. Yeah, bizarre how many people, me included, watch Real Vision on a Friday night or, you know, on a Saturday night or something with a glass of wine, it becomes our entertainment because we're thinking we're getting value out of it. So, you know, interesting enough, we, we um, ran a, um, a trial for one of the world's biggest asset managers, the world's biggest asset manager. And, um, and the, the, some of the senior people there said, look, we'd love to know when our staff are watching this. We don't want to disrupt their working days. Interesting enough, they were all watching at lunchtimes and evenings. And one guy wrote to us saying, my girlfriend and I stay on on a Friday night with a bottle of wine and watch our favorite Real Vision interview. I'm like, my God, this is a different world for finance. We've done something really right here. So, Raoul, I, I've been, uh, you know, looking over uh, recent issues of, of Global Macro Investor. And of course, I've seen you on Real Vision and, and on Twitter. I follow you. You're great on Twitter. So I, I sort of know where you're coming from, but, but I bet our listeners don't. So wh why don't we... Why don't we spend our time just kind of going through how Ralph Powell sees the world 
today. It's, it's a very interesting viewpoint. And I think the place to start, it seems to me the center of this for you, the center of your viewpoint of where things are at this moment is, is a strong U.S. dollar. Is that fair to say? Actually, it goes one step above that. So the very macro level, I use the business cycle to understand where we are. Now, with the ISM in the US as my indicator, one of my indicators of the business cycle, you know, it's it's it was just below 50, it's just above 50. So it tells you, and it peaked a long time ago, so it tells us we're in the down phase of the growth cycle. So we're expecting at some point a recession. So, and just for our listeners, what is the ISM, Ralph? The Institute of Supply and Management Survey, it, it um, basically surveys a bunch of buyers within the largest companies in America and ask them about financial conditions, market conditions, their inventories, you know, their expectations for the future. And it blends it all together and gives you an indicator that it's been going essentially in one way, shape or form. There was the Treasury survey before that since about 1910 or something. So 1917. So there's a huge amount of data. And what's interesting I found about it is all asset prices are correlated. Basically, the year on year change in the S&P, bond yields, copper, emerging markets, everything is related to the business cycle. The one thing that's the least related to the business cycle, bizarrely enough, is the US dollar. Um, the US dollar being the reserve currency of the world has a number of different drivers. It's called a Bayesian distribution, which means that it is many, many things inf influence it, unlike, let's say, bonds, which are really influenced by, by inflation and, and uh, interest rates. So there's a lot of inputs into a currency market. But the real big one here for people, listeners here to concern themselves over is in this bizarre world of massive monetary um, quantitative easing, there's not enough dollars in the world to service the debts. It's like a game of musical chairs. The issue is, is the, the foreigners, so the offshore dollar borrowing market, is about $15 trillion. I mean, it's truly enormous. And in the US, obviously, when we've seen the corporate debt markets and all of this, it's absolutely gigantic. But that whole amount of dollar borrowings and a slowdown in economic growth has mean it's the musical chairs to borrow the dollars, which is why periodically you're seeing things like the Argentine currency or the Turkish lira or the South African rand blowing up, is there's not enough dollars out there. And then when you enter into a slower growth environment like now where the oil price falls and the oil's, oil is traded in dollars, well, things like that mean there's even less dollars in the global system and there's a scramble for dollars. So we can see it in China, which is notoriously short of dollars right now, now, as the dollar goes higher, it drives down the price of commodities because all commodities are priced in dollars, and that creates yet more of a shortfall. Um, it also means that there's kind of less lubrication for the financial system globally. So the dollar is pretty much everything right now. And in the dollar, the Fed trade weighted dollar index, it's pretty much got its nose pressed against the ceiling of all time high. So it's extremely strong. And that's causing problems across the world. Does it surprise you to see a strong dollar and strong gold prices at the same time? No, my core thesis for some time was we were going to see both together, which is a very rare occurrence. Normally, gold falls as the dollar rallies because it's denominated in dollars. But gold started out performing 27 of the world's currencies. I have a GMI currency basket, which doesn't include US dollars. And gold started to outperform those which was telling us that monetary easing or that, that um, um, quantitative easing was actually devaluing all currencies against gold. Now, the dollar and gold, because the dollar shortage and gold being the rare asset, are both rallying together in this phase. Eventually, the dollar too will top out. I think it's going to come much higher than here, maybe even 20% higher than here, something quite devastating. And that will cause a massive devaluation of the dollar as other countries have to abandon it. We're hearing the talk of digital currencies and the move away from the dollar. So I think the dollar and gold go together. And eventually, gold is the last man standing. And, you know, I, I think there's other things too, whether it's cryptocurrencies or whatever. But that's generally my, my overall macro view for the longer term. I see. So, so you're long gold now then, along with being long dollar in some Yes, yeah, so I've been long gold against a basket of currencies for about two years. I've been long gold outright for about the last nine months. 
and I belonged the dollar. I switched all of my savings. I was living in Europe, billing in uh, euros, living in euros with my savings in euros. I switched my billing for Global Macro Investor um, entirely to dollars. I switched my entire savings to dollars, bought property in the US and the Cayman Islands as a way of forcing myself to hold dollars. And that's when the euro was at 148 and a half. And I've still held that bet to this day. I've actually noticed, Raoul, with you over the past, I don't know, I want to say year or so, you've been tracking the massive bubble in equity valuation as it, as it rises. But you're really shy about, you don't want to short it, though. That's just not the way to go at it for you. Why is that? Why don't you want to do that? So I've learned this from my 30 years of experience in this. So if you think of the reaction function of markets and the, the macro sensitivity of asset classes, the most macro sensitive of all are, is the short end of the bond market, because that is when they cut interest rates, it basically reflects that. There's very little froth bubble. There's, you get bits of overexposure and underexposure, but generally it reacts as it's supposed to, to cuts in interest rates. The next one is the long bond, which has some future expectations built in, so it's not quite as pure. Then I would say it's the commodity markets, which have quite a lot of speculation in, but they tend to reflect macro fundamentals. Then probably currencies, and then finally equities, because it's basically human emotion built on kind of long-term earnings expectations. So I found that the reaction function of the Federal Reserve say that if growth slows, they will cut rates therefore own bonds. So that's an easy trade. People tend to get confused and want to do the vanity trade, as I call it, which is short equities. Now, short equities, they come with much higher volatility. They don't look like a call option, which is what, let's say, the short end of the bond market looks like, which means that you get, they're unlikely to raise rates, but there is a high probability that they cut rates. So therefore, it looks like a call. It's a one-sided risk reward. Equities aren't, and you can see that in Tesla today. It's a really problematic market, particularly at the peak of bubbles and the peak of the cycle. So even though it's a clear bubble, it is impossible not to even think of it as a bubble now. You shouldn't do anything about it. If you do, just own bonds. It's a much better bet and is a much higher risk reward in all circumstances. Yeah, I have, actually, Rel, I have to credit you with, you said something on Twitter about this a while ago, quite a while ago, maybe a couple of years. And I was inspired to, in my own newsletter, Extreme Value, to show a chart of Apple around the, the dot-com peak. And I was trying to tell people, you know, trading this thing on either side of it is just absolutely insane. You know, even though it's the top, being short will crush you, you know, and going long, trying to, you know, go long, of course, is even worse. So a great example, like Again, to talk about true learnings, a friend of mine who's a great trader was running his own macro hedge fund back in 2000. He was extremely bearish and short as much as possible, and he lost 30% and had to close his fund. Why was that? The volatility of the equity market short was too high. In fact, over that 2000 bust, the equity market went up more days than it went down. So you ended up getting stopped out every time that you should have been adding to the trade. It was a really difficult situation, and it really taught me, be careful what instrument you use to express your view. And my old boss at GLG, Noam Gondelsman, who uh, founded and ran GLG, his view was very simple. He said, just keep it to the most simple expression of the view. Paul Tudor Jones was always the same. He said, don't give me complicated trades. Give me the simplest, purest expression and stick to that, because then you can apply leverage to it if, if you want to but you understand what bet you're taking. So purest, simplest, though, if I could just follow this line of thinking, it makes perfect sense. How is buying bonds purer and simpler than shorting equities if you're, if you're bearish on equities? Just walk me through because that. Because you know that if the equity market falls, the Fed are going to cut rates. So if you're, you're actually trading, you're trading an economic view, which is the economy is slow um, and therefore equities at the wrong valuation versus where the economy is, okay? That's the, essentially what a bubble is. So if you're trading the economic view, then the most macroeconomic sensitive variable is the, is the bond market. So trade the bond market because the Fed will cut if rates, if, if the equity market cracks. We saw it in 2000, we saw it in 2008. So you know the Fed have got your back in the trade. 
The Fed don't have your back in the equity market trade because usually you get a few of these massive rallies every time the Fed cut. So in which case, you'll, you'll make money in the bond market, but you'll lose money in the equity market. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm kind of hammering on this for the sake of the listener because I think it's a, kind of a brilliant insight because people are so, most of our, our Stansberry readers and podcast listeners, they're so hyper equity focused. And I love having you on because you're kind of the opposite. You're not that way at all. So I really appreciate that. I want to shift gears a little bit, Ralph. I, I, but sorry, just the key thing, Dan. Yeah, yeah. Is, you know, if everyone's an equity person, just the TLT is your friend. It is a great ETF that will help you make intelligent decisions. And people say, why would I want to own bonds with yield so low? It's not a yield game. It, it goes up in price significantly. You know, TLT has been has been a really good performer already this year. It was a great performer last year. So just because it's bonds, you can still get performance. And that's the key thing. Yeah, I looked at the chart of that last night as I was reading through some of your stuff. And it, TLT has ripped, I mean, better than stocks. It's really awesome. So I said a second ago, I, I wanted to switch gears because I'm curious about I'm curious about where you are in your coronavirus. You, you put out a, an update in January and you were like, hey, man, this thing, you got to get ahead of this thing. It trades on fear and emotion. And, you know, that's been a couple of weeks now. And so where, where are you in that? Well, I mean, that was a, you know, I, I was in early to that environment. And yeah, it sounds a bit gruesome because you're trading, you know, bad headlines. But really, uh, this is going to trade very similar to Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, um, and 9-11, um, bizarrely enough. Um, the other examples that were similar that gripped the world, one was the Asian crisis, which was somewhat different. And secondly, was SARS. So SARS, why it's not like SARS is SARS was 2003. The, the central banks had cut rates. The equity market had collapsed already. So you were in a recovery phase, which was quite hard to fight. So yes, the bond market rallied, but it wasn't really an economic event as such. But Gulf War One, Gulf War II and 9-11 um, uh, and were demand shocks and supply shocks, the supply of oil and demand for goods as, as we go to war. This is very similar. It's all about how people react to the outcome. So how people react to something like this is China goes into massive lockdown because they know it's bigger than they're reporting and it's huge. So you basically shut down all economic activity in China, which is truly astonishing. But again, it's not China necessarily. It's what everybody else looks at that, sees how China is reacting so strongly and they know that they have only one chance to react and they better overreact. And the overreaction is shutting down all flights to China, stopping at imports of people. Kids in Singapore are not going back to school till mid-March. People are shutting down borders with China. Um, Russia has, Hong Kong's gonna shut down its border with China. Um, you know, we've seen the US ban people coming from China. This is a huge thing. And it's that behavior of the humans making rational decisions themselves saying, Listen, I don't want to travel up to New York today because, you know, I know it's silly, but I just don't want to take that risk. That's a normal thing to do. Um, what happens is when you compound that, you create big, enormous black holes, both in um, the econ the global economy, just when it's weak, which is why Gulf War One, Gulf War Two and 9-11 were interesting, because all of the time the economies were weak. The ISMs are at 50 or lower where we are now. So the business cycle was weak. So this is a shock that pushes things over compounding onto the top of the trade tariffs. So that situation is still outstanding. It will continue for a while as we get to understand the spread of the virus amongst other countries. And nobody's going to want to go in short the equity market or short of bonds, along the equity market or short of bonds going into weekends because the news flow comes out where you get this clustered effect of, of several days news coming out as the spread of the virus continues. So that whole thing is going to take, because of the incubation periods and how long this takes out and the seasonality, it'll probably take until February or March if it's just a normal event. If it really does spread abroad, it'll go on longer as well. So that whole process is only just started. And I think that will play out for the next couple of months. And I think the impact on the global economy is meaningful and real. And there are going to be some real supply chain disruptions um, from and to China that may break forever as compounding on top of the 
trade tariffs where companies have to decide, maybe I don't want to manufacture in China any longer. And I think that is going to be the case. The world is going to see that its reliance on China is too much and is going to start pushing away still. Right. And was it you? I'm sorry, Ralph. Um, I've read a bunch of stuff about this in the last 24, 48 hours. Was it you who, I, I think you were the one who said that you thought the Fed was going to cut in March, not in June? Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know, gonna, that, of course. Basis point. I think the Fed are going to have to cut 50 basis points reasonably fast. The economic data for February is going to be terrible. And when you compare it to the year on year base effect versus last year, where we had just peaked in, um, you know, from the equity market that had rallied so strongly and some of the economic data had as well, we're going to have some really tough year on year comparisons and we're going to have this drop off. So we're going to see some really weak growth in February and March. And I don't think the market's expecting it. It may be the thing that brings the equity market down. I'm not sure. But again, as we said, as we talked about before, it's not really my bet. 50 bips really fast, huh? Like all at once or maybe, you know, an interim cut or something like that? I think it's a 50 and a 50. I think I honestly think that there's a decent likelihood they'll cut 100 basis points by June. And that will be that will be nice ahead of the election, which is pretty much what Trump would like as well. I think that's what we're going to do is the Fed try and restart, steepen the yield curve, which is negative pretty much all the way along. And And so wouldn't you want to own the short end of that rather than the TLT or no? Yes, it's my biggest bet. So currently, um, I have both TLT and the short end, the euro dollar futures market. Um, I will, as the curve begins to steepen, I would reduce my TLT exposure, even though it'll still perform. It's called a bullish steepening, where the long end goes up, but the short end goes up even more in terms of price and you know down in terms of yield. Um, so I, um, I'm kind of full risk in fixed income right now. And I will skew that bet towards the short end, where I think the real juice is to be had over the next three months. Yeah, I, I, I actually, you know, I write this bottom up, you know, mostly U.S. actually U.S. and Canadian equity newsletter. You know, we pick stocks one at a time, but I just could not help myself, and we added that, you know, the SHY, the the short term Treasury ETF, because. Like I, I couldn't help myself and I couldn't see how it would go wrong, you know. So, you know, even the guy who who spends his life looking at company balance sheets and things just could not I absolutely cannot resist it. It's 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 a force of gravity. Yeah, it makes such sense to me because of the reaction function of the Fed and the fact that they're not gonna raise rates. So yes, you might have some downside, you might get some volatility, we've had a sell-off in the last few days in the SHY, but the reality is the risk reward is so massively skewed to the upside. So bets like that are great. And the Fed's yeah, got your like back. Yeah, but like sell-off. Yeah, the Fed's got your back. And you know, by sell-off, we don't mean down you know, 10 or 20% either, right? So it's, no. it's really skewed, really skewed. You know, very exactly. little downside and woo, yeah, rips when they, when they cut. I just feel like I can't trust any of these numbers. It ticked over 20,000 cases of corona this morning, of course, overwhelmingly, like 99% in in China. But I, there's something about that culture where I just, you know, like you said, they're massively on lockdown and the reporting is, I feel like everything is underreported. And I wonder when and if we're ever going to find a real number. I've seen some people, they're modeling the thing, and they say it should be 100,000 cases by now. Have you seen that? Yeah, I agree. And the answer is, look at what's happening in the other countries. That's your answer. When you, when you see the, the, the death rate, the recovery rate, and the spread rates from third countries, third-party countries like Singapore that will probably factually account, then you're getting a much better understanding. So... You know, it's relatively new there, so it's probably about a month behind in the cycle. So let's see how that develops over the course of a month, and then we'll have a true understanding. So for me, it's not the Chinese part of the equation that we need to watch. It's all of the other countries that have the virus. I mean, God forbid if this spreads into India. that India have had a case, but if it does, they're not set up for this. Um, you know, it's a real problem. So, you know, we have to watch this very carefully. And well, that's that's one of the data points that has come out of China. Like Wuhan was not set up for it. I think they had like, you know, 110 beds available. And of course, now they're massively building hospital 
you know, bed capacity. But that's been the explanation that I've gotten so far for why the death rate was so high just in that one area, because it quickly overwhelmed them. And of course, you know, they're, they don't want to let it out. So they were, they were probably doing two things at once, I figure. Yeah, China has some great advantages because it's a command economy. So I'm speaking to somebody whose family is from Wuhan and is there now. Basically, because the government is able to track every single individual, you know, we've heard about the new kind of cyber state um, surveillance state that China set up. So they have tracked down every single person who left Wuhan and, and Hubei province, found where they are and has approached them and asked them to go into incubation. Um, so there are whole. So hotel, there are empty hotels all over right now because nobody's traveling. So they're filling them with people who come out of the province and saying, right, you're going to stay in this hotel under surveillance for, for uh, two weeks. Because China can do that. Nobody else can do that. So, so China, even though it's very big, they have some sort of chance of trying to curtail it. Um, I don't think any other countries really can. So, and I'm not going to be alarmist and say it's definitely spreading. It's definitely going to be the world's biggest pandemic. I have no idea, literally no clue. All I care about is how the market's going to perceive it. And my view is that the market's going to perceive this as more concerning. Right. But as we speak, though, not today. <laughs> not <laughs> the today. stock market doesn't seem to care today. <laughs> yeah. Again, ignore the stock market. Turn it off your screen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, even the bond market doesn't care today. But yeah, that's the way it's got to go. It's got to go in phases. We've had a huge move up in in uh, all this all, all fixed income right now. It should consolidate for a bit. And as I said, nobody wants to go in um, short fixed income into the weekend. So, you know, I think we've got a chance of a weak non-farm payroll coming out on Friday. Um, and that would only fan the flames of the bond market screaming for Fed cuts. Okay. Actually, we're, we're, we've been talking for a while here. I'm going to let you go soon. But just a couple more things, Ralph. You, you of course, have a, a, a massive guest bit in your latest newsletter from a gal named Tracy from, from, uh, that we all follow who are interested in crude oil. We all follow her on Twitter. And, and it was an excellent little piece. Are you short crude oil right now or no? No, because I don't need to. Because being short crude oil is basically the two trades that are going to do better. Because crude is very volatile and you've got this geopolitical risk of shorting crude is as crude oil falls, it makes my dollars, my bonds go up. So I'm happy because inflation expectations collapse. And it also makes dollars go up because there's a shortage of dollars as the price of crude falls. So it works in my two core trades, which is uh, as anybody on Twitter follows me, buy bonds, wear diamonds, which means buy bonds and, and you'll make plenty of money. Um, and it's the same with, uh, with um, dollars too. So that trade, I wouldn't short crude oil. I have been on and off short the... the um, the uh, the oil stocks, and I think the oil stocks halved from here over time, based on not only the crude oil oversupply dynamics, um, and, but also because I think that over time, there's going to be more potential litigation against the oil companies. So, um, so, I, so I'm happy to be structurally short um, oil producing companies, but I'm not currently right now. My whole focus is on, on bonds and dollars. All right. Well, I, I really appreciate you being here. I'd like to to ask you one more question, though. This is I ask all my guests this, and it has produced some wonderful answers. But if you don't want to answer it, that's cool too. If I could ask you, Ralph, to just leave our listeners, if I forced you to just leave our listeners with only one thought, I think I can guess in your case. But if I could force you to leave them with only one thought, what would that thought be? Buy bonds, wear diamonds. Buy bonds and you will soon be wearing diamonds, huh? Exactly right. It's an old expression from the uh, bond market in the 80s and 90s. But it's basically filter all the noise out. And what is it that you're trying to say? We're trying to say we're in an over-debt burdened, over-leveraged, slow growth, risky world. So the opportunity set in owning bonds for the price appreciation is as interest rates in the US, which are the highest in all of the developing world, merge to that of the, the rest of the world and go to zero. That is a one of the last, I think, home run trades 
in fixed income that we'll get is this one trade left. Thank you so much, Ral. I, I sincerely hope that we will get to talk to you again and you know just check back up on all of this sometime in the in the future. I've got a couple of pieces out in Real Vision where I dig into some of this. So if people want to go across to realvision.com, there's a there's a there's a, a crazy offer of a one dollar um, for one month's access of Real Vision. I urge you to do it because it'll be the best dollar you've ever spent in your life. And even if you don't like what I say, there's, there's literally one and a half thousand interviews of amazing people with incredible views. And we've got some huge stuff coming up, particularly on the retirement crisis in America. Uh, we've got a two weeks of huge content coming up. So people go, go, go and have a look at that. I think they'll really enjoy it. Well, wow, that's a whole month for a dollar? Yeah. Wow. That's, that's an amazing deal. That's an amazing deal. Thank you. Um, okay, Ralph, I'm going to let you go. Thanks so much for being here. And, and I hope we'll talk soon. Yep. Thanks very much for having me, Dan. Really enjoyed it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. So, you know, wow, that guy obviously is brilliant. And uh, I I always feel like when I hear from Rao, um, usually on on Real Vision, actually, I've I've never spoken to him before, first time. But, But anytime you hear from him, you always have the feeling that we just got from him, that you were talking to somebody who knows what's happening in the world to a significant degree in global financial markets and can just reach out, simplify it all, and pinpoint that one really awesome trade idea as he did for us. And I hope we'll talk to him again, man. Awesome. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Okay, it's time for the mailbag. In my mind, you know, this is the heart of the podcast because our goal is to to help folks become better investors, myself included. And this is where you and I get to have a frank conversation and help each other become better investors. Uh, Just write in to feedback at investorhour.com with your comments, questions, and politely worded criticisms, and I'll read them all and respond to as many on the show as possible. Very little in the mailbag that required any sort of a comment. There were lots of comments and things, but but not much that, that required an answer this week. Just people telling us to stop talking. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's a podcast and, and people talk on podcasts, right? But, uh, you know, so I don't know if I can fix that. But we got a couple, couple of good ones here. First one is from Roger M. And Roger M says, hi, Dan, great podcast. In a very short space of time, it's become a must listen to for me. Thank you, Roger. Roger continues, my question is, if one believes that the stock market is due a correction, then what are the advantages of buying into an inverse S&P 500 ETF as opposed to simply placing a short trade on the index itself? Thank you in advance, Roger M. Well, Roger, one advantage is you get to shoot yourself in the head later on for buying this garbage. (laughs) <laughs> and and I just I really am not a fan of these inverse ETFs. They're they're levered usually, you know, it's usually at least like two times the inverse of the index. And you have to understand they're designed to perform over a fairly short period of time. So they tend to be I mean because most of them are levered of course, they tend to be really volatile and I just don't like them. I would much rather, I would much rather, actually, after today's podcast, I'd rather just buy bonds, man, (laughs) frankly, or I'd rather hold cash or buy bonds. Or, you know, maybe you take, if you want to hedge, you take a small amount of capital and, and you buy a put option on an index, something like that. I'd rather do those things because it's either safer in the case of bonds and cash or just a much smaller risk in terms of total portfolio in the case of the little, you know, hedge put option position. So that's my answer. Not a fan, but good question. I'm glad you asked. Okay. This next one is, has a lot of parts to it and it's our, it's our second and last question this week, but it's got a lot of good, good questions in it. And I feel like I really need to respond. And it is from Eamon M. Eamon M. Eamon, thank you for for writing this very thoughtful email. 
It says, hello, Dan. Like you, I have been a longtime shareholder of Altius and have a high regard for the management team. Oh, I should tell you, as I go, I'm going to comment on these things as I go because there are many things to comment on. So I'll let you know when it's my comment and when it's him. So, so Eamon says, I've been a longtime shareholder like you of Altius and I have a high regard for management team. My comment is, I'm contractually forbidden by Stansberry to own shares of Altius because I write about it in my newsletter. So not a longtime shareholder, but I've been writing about it in my newsletter since 2009. So he continues, on your latest podcast, you mentioned concerning Apple that a company can be a great company, but not a great investment. I'm beginning to wonder whether the same story could be applied to Altius. My comment is, I said Apple might be a great company and not a great investment right now. It is a great company, definitely, but maybe not a great investment right now solely because the stock went from 13 times earnings to 26 times earnings really fast over the past year or so as sales and earnings fell from from fiscal 2018 to fiscal 2019. And, And that didn't make a lot of sense to me. He continues, there is a very revealing chart on the website, Corner of Berkshire and Fairfax, which charts Altius's underperformance relative to the S&P 500 over the last five to eight years. It highlights the opportunity cost involved in holding the stock against just the index. My comment is this doesn't mean a lot to me because, you know, your portfolio does not consist of just Altius minerals holding against the index. And, And also the index is not the correct benchmark. You know, this is a it's a commodity company. So you got to gauge it against commodity benchmark. And it's kind of, you know, it's done pretty well usually. When things are bad for other commodity companies, they're usually not nearly as bad for Altius. And, you know, Altius performs well when when the rest of them perform well. So, and none of this, none of what you said about the chart, which doesn't mean anything to me anyway, (laughs) makes it a bad buy today, as you acknowledge later on in your email. He continues, while the company will oftentimes make reference to a stock performance since to its stock performance since inception, this simply masked recent underperformance. But then he says, the early years contained most of the outperformance of the stock due to a low initial base valuation in the sale of the CMB uranium asset, which is to date the only home run the company has achieved. My comment is, I know what you mean by home runs. You're talking about prospect generation home runs. But there's more to the company than that. Their investments in Virginia mines and international royalty generated tens of millions of dollars. The royalty portfolio, frankly, is a home run in my view because it increased the revenues more than 20 fold from 3 million to just the ballpark of 70 million annually. So I consider that a home run. Then he continues, some recent company presentations make reference to other home runs potentially and he says at a 500 million enterprise value, it'll take something significant to move the needle. I'm no expert, but it's hard to see where this is going to come from. My comment is nobody, including Altius, will know where it comes from until it happens. It's, there's no expertise that can predict that. It's not difficult to, to see. It's impossible for anyone to see. And 100 million would move the needle. And that, I think that's what you can expect out of one of these. 100, 200, you know, like that. That, that's what I would consider a home run. And that would move the needle on actually a, more like a 400 million market cap. It'll move the needle on the equity value big and, and more than on the enterprise value total. Okay, so he continues, there's no doubt that Altius is very undervalued at present. And then he says some other stuff. There's one factor which is within their control and on which they have disappointed me to date, share buybacks. Until the recent repurchase of 389,000 shares in December, the share repurchase program has been immaterial and anemic at best. Hopefully, the recent repurchase is the start of something more meaningful. I don't understand their decision to invest in wind royalties. It's outside their circle of competence and an area better suited to the finance industry than to mining entrepreneurs. I will agree to disagree here, Eamon. Wind is a resource, and they're resource financiers, and they're some of the very best on earth, and they 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 wipe the floor up with those finance people you're talking about. Royalties are a sophisticated financing vehicle, and that and they're very good at it. They're much more savvy than the, the average finance industry professional. So, you know, those finance industry guys, they lend into bubbles and they lend at the top, and Altius sits on capital for years at a time and waits for that downturn and then steps in. You know, I just think they're they're 10 times better at it. 
And as far as the share repurchases go, Eman offers a uh, Restoration hardware as an extreme example, but gives the flavor of what can be achieved with an aggressive buyback program. My comment is, I, I, I'm glad they're not aggressive share repurchasers. Well, I'm glad that they don't borrow money. And, and frankly, in the, in the example of restoration hardware, the market is behaving with that company the way it's behaving with many companies. It's not seeing the cyclicality in the business at all. I think one day everybody will point to companies that had big run-ups in the bubble as examples of how most share repurchases are huge mistakes. So I totally disagree about the share repurchases. If Altius bought back stock without borrowing the money to do it, hey, fine, cool, great. Great use of, of royalty income. I agree. I think they should accumulate the capital and pay down debt in anticipation of further opportunities to grow the business. This company is teeny tiny in relation to the size of the opportunity in the non-precious metals royalties. That's their original thesis. You know, the non-precious metal mining sector is like five or six times the size of precious metal, but the precious metal royalty companies are, you know, many times the size of Altius and the one or two others that, you know, are anything remotely close to what it does. And it has, it is much more diversified than any other, you know, so... Personally, I'd rather see them pay out the royalty and dividends than make share of purchases because income opportunities the world over are total crap right now. And, and creating a new one would attract a lot more value-minded, long-term type investors than just becoming another moronic company loading up on debt and taking risk to buy back stock. Remember, debt creates risk for equity holders. I pray they don't do that. If Altius borrows money to buy back shares, the way I've pounded the table on their brilliant capital allocation skills since 2009, for God's sake, if they do that, I would consider recommending you know, selling the stock and just not covering it anymore. Because I think as capital allocators, they're, they're too smart to do anything like that. They know the size of the opportunity they're going after. And buying back a few shares here and there is okay with me as long as they don't borrow money to do it. And the stock is cheap, so I agree about that. Buying back shares is a good deal for them right now. You and I definitely agree about that. But borrowing money and being too aggressive, eh, usually doesn't work out terribly well you know, over the long term. Cycles happen. And, and cycles make a lot of share repurchases look really stupid. But, you know, these are very good questions. You're, you're, you know, you're pushing the pressure points in the right spot and asking some good questions. So I, I thank you for that, Eamon. And, and that's all I have to say about it. Thanks very much. And that brings us to the end of another episode of Stansberry Investor Hour. Thanks very much. Uh, and remember to go to InvestorHour.com. You can see every episode we've ever done. And you can see a transcript for every episode we've ever done. And remember, sometimes it takes maybe a few or several days or something to get that transcript for the latest episode. But you should find them for, for all the other ones. Just choose the episode you want, scroll all the way down, and the transcript is at the bottom. But what you really should do is subscribe to us on iTunes. Subscribe to Stansberry Investor Hour on iTunes. Click that button that says like. Push us up in the rankings. Help us get this thing out to more people and attract lots more good questions like the folks asked today so that we can have an even better conversation that will make us even better investors. Right? You win, I win, we all win, and the world becomes a more wonderful place. It's my privilege to come to you this week and every week. Thank you so much. I really look forward to next time. Bye-bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email at feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.